was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now save am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, there is my soul's best song. Faithful, loving, serving to, to Him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Last verse right here, church. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He's your savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Yes, it does, always. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to 198. 198, please. Hey. 198, I'm still on the way there. I know some of y'all ready. Y'all got the 198 ready, and I'm still turning here. All right, there we go. Praise the Lord. All right. For time's sake, we're going to do all four verses. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Only one way to be washed in that blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you weep a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's high. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin 
Living stains are lost in this life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ask church to please stand with me, please. And let's go ahead to go 510. 510. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 510. 510, brother. And uh, let's go ahead and for time's sake, let's go to one, two, and four. One, two, and four. Right. Shall we gather at the river where bright angels' feet have trod? With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river That flows by the throne of God on the bosom of the river where the sacred king is owned we shall meet in sorrow and ever the glory of the throne yes we'll gather at the river the beautiful beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Soon we'll reach the shining river, soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Amen. Amen. Ask, uh, Brother Ralph, if you could open up service with prayer, please. Heavenly Father. God, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us all here, Jesus Christ, to hear your word, Heavenly Father, to praise and worship you, God. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, please forgive us for our sins, Lord, Heavenly Father. Lord, I feel like, God, you've convicted my heart, Lord, God, each and every day, Lord, to make me realize, God, that every single day we deal with choices, Lord, God, whether they be temptations or to praise you, God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, please soften our hearts, Lord Jesus Christ, that we may make better decisions each and every day, Lord, to glorify yes, Lord. you, Lord God, to die in our sins, Lord God. I pray, my Father, please, Lord, bless this service, Lord. Please protect this service, Lord, for many hindrances, Lord. Please bless yes, Lord. technology, please God. Please, Heavenly Father, fill past with your Holy Spirit, Lord yeah. Jesus Christ. Please put Heavenly Father, put him aside, Lord God, and, and use him, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit by your grace to, to teach us, Lord God, your Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you. Some good prayer. Good prayer. You can you can uh, you can kind of hear when uh, some folks are praying, uh, which ones are genuine, you know. Uh, That's right. 
you can tell when they're fellowshipping with the Lord um, often uh, by their prayers. Amen. So um, yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to white hymnals now. And we're going to go to number 33, all five verses. Amen. And this is a great hymn uh, because we got some folks that think they come out here, just go through it, get the one verse down. And they get it, and that's it. But this one will keep you on your toes because it changes the melody four times in this one. So just to think about it, it's not going to stay the same. And, uh, <laughs> you, know, you guys got to be on your toes over here. Praise the Lord. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused him pain for me who him in death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Tis mystery all the mortal dies Who can't explore his strange design In vain the first for serpent tries To sound the depths of love divine tis mercy all let earth adore then our angels might inquire no more tis mercy all let earth Condemnation now I 
First, I have this handy dandy volunteer sheet that I would like to pass around for all to sign. This is for the month of June. Um, here you go, There's a pen along with it. Just to, as a reminder, please show up or let me know if you are unable to make it. Um, I know some of you have already notified me, but please let me know in advance so that we can at least plan accordingly. That is very important. Um, Luckily, we don't have, actually, I don't know if it's a lucky thing, but you know what? Today, we don't have any newcomers. We don't need to pass out any newcomer cards, so there, that is that. Today, we were going to have street preaching, but unfortunately, we got rained out. That one is unfortunate because I thought we could preach the gospel on the streets, but we got rained out. So next week, we will have street preaching again. Lord willing, it won't rain this time. <laughs> we're going to have street preaching next week at 10 a.m., so we'll see you guys there. Um, this week, our... Memory verses are going to be Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 10. Galatians 5, 9 through 10. I believe we went over 7 through 8 last week, so we're going through the entire chapter. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 9 through 10. Oh, this is a very... Verse 9 is actually a pretty famous verse. Uh, we quote it all the time. I'm sure you've heard of the brethren mention this some, in some way, shape, or form once at one point or another. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. And the Bible says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. So those are our verses for this week. Believe it or not, we're almost through. We only have, I think by the next month we'll be done with Galatians 5, maybe. But we've actually memorized a lot of verses. We've memorized Isaiah 53, Romans 10, which has 21 verses. Now we're going to memorize the entire chapter of Galatians 5, which is 26. So by the end of this year, we're going to have a lot of verses under our belt. So this is going to be really good. Uh, important announcement for summer camp. We need the fees today. If you don't have it today, give it to us next week. But we have to have it next week at the latest. If you have it today, please give it to us today. But if you don't, give it to us next week. It is $215 for whoever is going to camp. Very important. Um, Sorry, it's 225. Oh, it's 225? Okay. I apologize. So it's 225 now we're amended. We're so poor that we can't stretch dollars more, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so <laughs> amended, amended price is $225. It'll be due next week at the latest. We need that next week, so please bring it. Um, and if you have it today, it's better. So, so with that, that wraps the announcements, and I'm going to call Pastor up for... A special. When good things happen in life and even bad things happen in life, sometimes we got to understand that whatever God does is more than enough because there's only one thing that all he had to do which proved that he did more than enough and that was he saved my soul from a burning hell Amen. and gave me the glories of heaven because of that that's there's nothing more that he needs to give to me no matter what bad or good I go through in life
If I never see the light of day Or felt the sun, the warm delight of each ray Never to hear the birds sing cheerfully Or to feel the wind blow through the trees if I never experience all of these To know that he saved me Is more than enough If I never walk along the shores Or feel the wet, cold sand beneath my feet Never to see the moon shine down on me Or just to think on how things came to be If I never experience all of these To know that he saved me Is more than enough More than enough was salvation Amen. to do without all other blessings will be sufficient yeah. just to have so much and more of all these things through our dear Lord to know that he saved me is more than enough Oh, just to have so much and more Of all these things through our dear Lord To know that He saved me yeah. Is more than enough More than enough More than enough, that's it All right Thank you. Uh, we're going to ask, I'm going to ask Brother Jesse and Brother Lee to come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us. If Brother Lee and Brother Jesse can come forward to take up the Lord's offering for us. And I would like to ask Brother Jesse to open up the offering with a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. I pray that you uh, forgive me for my sins. Amen. I pray that you forgive all of us for our sins, because we all know that we all fall short of the glory of God. I pray that you use this sermon to glorify you, Lord. I hope this sermon, I hope you fill this room with the Holy Spirit. Yes, I pray that anybody, any lost souls watching online get saved yes. today yeah. through this That's sermon. That's good. I pray for the people that are not here that couldn't make it to church. Yeah. I pray that their faith is strong, even though they are not here. That's good. And I also pray that you use this money today, Lord, that... He uses money for your glory, yeah. down to the last penny. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's for good. your glory, yeah, so that souls can get saved. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Good prayer, brother. Lamentations chapter 4, please. Lamentations chapter 4. I want to thank everybody for doing their part to help out the church. Thank you. Um, one thing that I would like to request, if anyone's watching online or if you're in this room hearing this, if you signed up for the volunteer sheet, please be there to take care of it because today we... Um, thought that we had some people uh, on a certain role for a volunteer duty, like today, for example, and then it's not there. Now, some of you, as long as you give the announcer heads up, that's fine, but um, if you didn't, then 
but we got to make sure that there's a substitute for that one. So if you can do that next time, please, then we truly appreciate that. Okay, so Lamentations chapter 4, we'll read verse 5. Oh, Lamentations okay. chapter 4. Right. And then we'll read verse 5. The prophet Jeremiah, he gives his lamentation about the nation of the children of Israel because they have sinned against the Almighty God. And then God, he gave them tremendous pain. He gave them tremendous punishment and judgment where the Babylonians came inside Jerusalem and just ruined the whole place. And because of that, Jeremiah was in grief. And he was mourning. In fact, when you read the description of sorrow and mourning in the Bible, you'll see a lot of it is pretty strong. Like this example. Let's look at verse 5. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. Wow, notice that the prophet Jeremiah he is so much in grief that he's talking about actually embracing a dunghill. So basically loving manure. How about that? How about that? So notice that verse 5 that Jeremiah takes us to the extreme about mourning so much to the point as if he's embracing manure. And unfortunately today we have many people who mourn about the problems that they're going through, and they mourn so much it's as if it's a strange thing. It's like as if they love to mourn. They love to complain. They love to whine. They want to have a self-pity party. It's as if they want that, as Jeremiah called it, manure on themselves. Why do you love the manure? Don't you want to be away from the manure? Don't you think that it stinks? Don't you think that it grieves you, that it brings you down? But unfortunately, many of us today, when we go through problems in life, it's as if we love the manure. Yeah. Now, concerning with people who go through problems, I always focused on a sermon where it would actually comfort them, where it would actually uplift them. Because if someone lost a person who passed away in a funeral service, you obviously should lift them up. That's not a time where you slap them on the face. <laughs> But then it seems like that the Lord laid upon my heart that concerning this kind of preaching, that for people who are going through problems, it's like as if they need to be slapped awake. So in this sermon, I'm going to switch it into a preaching mode, into a convicting mode for those of you who are in grief, for those of you who are in pain, for those of you who have problems. You might say, why is that? Because you need that once in a while. You cried too long. You've already been in grief too long. You're already on the ground too long. It's about time that you got to get a little bit of that slap in you and say, hey, get a grip. Get a grip. Wake up. Get up. Get your, hold yourself together, man. You need that at least once. If you don't get that at least once while you're going through such overt grief, then that grief will weigh you down and kill you. So I hope that this preaching, it will get you to wake up a bit and it'll help you to see the light a bit and make you stop feeling sorry for yourself. Today my title is Love the Nasty Manure. Let's pray. The great I am that I am, all Father God Almighty, I pray that you'll please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Wash away my sins with your precious and most holy blood. For Father, I am nothing but dust and ashes. I am actually, as the prophet wrote, Dunghill. But thank you so much for using a piece of dirt like me to glorify and honor you. There are so many others you can use. Father, this is your tool today, your broken vessel today, so I pray that you'll use me so that you can speak to your people so that they can change their lives and better glorify you. If anyone, I pray that this preaching will definitely reach anyone out there who is going through such grief and through such mourning. And that will speak to them and then they can get a grip on themselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. My first point is the manure of sacrifice. The manure of sacrifice. A lot of people, they love and they wallow in the manure because they sacrificed many of their things that they used to enjoy. And that is very true. When you 
become a saved Christian, and when you especially attend a Bible-believing church, all of a sudden you realize, oh man, now i got to get rid of that because pastor says it's a sin. Oh, I can't watch that anymore. Oh, I can't listen to that anymore. Oh, I can't dress up like that anymore. Why? Because pastor preached against it. And sure, it may feel like a lot of sacrifice to you because you get rid of a lot of what you enjoy. You wallow and in the manure of self-pity because of a lot of possessions that you gave up. Some of you lived in a nice place before. Some of you had a lot of good possessions before. You had certain companions in your life that you enjoyed, but then when you came to this church, you lost your old friends. You lost your nice possessions. Some of you lost your nice jobs and you had to switch careers. Some of you had to give up your homes, your places and families. And then because of that, it feels like a lot of sacrifice. And you wallow and you mourn and you say, Oh, woe is me. Serving God is so difficult. I had to give this up and that up. Then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Jesus Christ, he tells you to, hey, shouldn't your focus be laying up treasures in heaven, not on earth? Because on earth, that's where it becomes corrupt. On earth, it's nothing. It turns into dust in the end. I mean, you got to realize how base your sacrifices are. The things that you loved and you gave up for the Lord. You got to realize how base and demeaning they are. That's good. That's you got to realize that. If some billionaire was to tell you, hey, give up your house. Oh, I gave up my house. Woe is me. No, give up your house and I'll give you a Beverly Hills mansion. You're going to go, oh, okay, that, that's not a problem. If that same billionaire told you to give up your car for a Ferrari, your money for a thousand diamonds, and giving up those poor nobodies that you hang around with, powerful and rich big shots, you know what people in this world would do? Normally, people in this world, they're not going to go, oh, woe is me, I got to give that up. They're going to go, gladly, I give it up. Because they realize how... Uh, meaningless and base those things are compared to what that billionaire offers to them. Now, my question to you is why can't you act the same way when you sacrifice your house for a heavenly mansion, your car for horses of fire, your money for piles of gold, silver, and precious stones, and your earthly companions for the heavenly millions and the creator of the universe himself to be your companion? See, so then you want to be wallowing about, oh, I gave up this. Oh, it's too much of a sacrifice. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. See, you know what you're doing? You're focusing on things of this earth, not on things of heaven. And if you were to focus on things of heaven, you would easily and gladly give up where you used to live, what you used to have, what you used to watch and hear and taste and dress like. My second point is manure of sin. Believe it or not, people love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because they fall so frequently to their sinful habits. And they feel like, oh, woe is me. Oh, I feel down because I messed up again. I disobeyed again. I let God down again. And don't get me wrong. It is understandable. It's good that you should have guilt. It is good that you should have anger and fear concerning sin. If you don't have guilt over what you've sinned, I think you've got a major problem. You better repent and get right with God. Amen. But there are people out there who just feel like that they can't have victory over what their sinful struggle is. They feel like they left the church down again. They let the pastor down again. They feel like that they haven't uh, been consistent in their walk with the Lord and their duties for the church. But Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 reads, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, you got to realize this. When it comes to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ taking up all your sins upon himself, it is something that you should glory and feel thankful for rather than wallowing in self-pity and in sorrow. Now, you got to think about this. Do you know the real reason why you wallow in your self-pity concerning about falling into sin again? It's not because you don't want to fall into sin again. 
It's because you don't want to try cleaning up your life again. That's why. It's because you're tired of, oh man, I got to repent, confess, get right with God again. You're tired of, I got to rededicate myself again. You're tired of taking it more seriously because it feels like extra work for you. That's the real reason why you wallow in your self-pity. It's not because of you don't want to fall into sin again. It's because of all those things, that process, that cycle of going through repentance, confession, renewal with God again. Human nature, they don't like a cycle. Didn't you know that? Human nature, they don't like that. But sometimes you got to realize it's, it's a daily struggle and battle till the day you die. A lot of people, they just want to hit the victory and say, oh, put it behind me, I'm done. But you got to realize is that victory is attained through constant up and down, up and down, struggle, struggle, and fighting and fighting. You got to realize this is that you should be thinking about Jesus Christ who crucified himself to take all your sins upon himself, not on yourself about, oh, poor you, oh, woe is me, oh, I have to work again, oh, I have to clean up again, oh, I have to rededicate my life again. Oh, you know what you're doing? You're thinking about yourself rather than Jesus Christ. And that's what wallowing in self-pity does. That's what loving the nasty manure does. It's all about me, me, me. Even when you fall into sin, you're thinking about yourself, not about Jesus Christ. If you thought about Jesus Christ and you would realize that you would be thankful, like Paul said, I would glory in Jesus Christ being crucified, where the world and my flesh is crucified unto the cross of Jesus Christ. When you rededicate your life again, when you repent again, when you confess again, the reason why those shouldn't be a hassle to you, but rather gratefulness to you, is because I thank God there is a cross that I can turn to to get rid of this sin. Amen. I thank God that there's a cross I can just lay my burden down and have Jesus wipe my slate clean again. Shouldn't you be thankful when you confess the thousandth time that the cross is so powerful to forgive you the thousandth time? Shouldn't that increase your joy rather than your sorrow? Amen. Right. Stop wallowing in your self-pity of, oh, I fell into sin again. No, just keep... Get rid of that bottle. Stop smoking that cigarette. Put down that music. Stop crying about watching us online. Oh, I'm not there in church. No, shut off that laptop and drive your way here to church today. I think we'll be very happy to see you walking in the middle of this church service. I mean, get right with God. Stop wallowing in your self-pity. Get out of there. Get out of there. Because you're thinking about yourself. That's what you're doing. That's what you're thinking about yourself. You love to feel the guilt. You love to cling on to, woe is me, woe is me. Poor me, I wish I could overcome this. No, the cross of Jesus Christ overcomes the world. So why don't you go to that cross again? My third point is a manure of sowing and reaping. The manure of sowing and reaping. You know, people love and wallow in their self-pity of... The manure of self-pity because they go through... oh. Yep, this bad stuff is happening to me because of my sin. They don't like sowing and reaping. A lot of you are suffering, unfortunately, the consequences of your sin, and it's hurting you. And, of course, I'm not saying that you should jump up and down, Woohoo! I'm getting punished, my God. <laughs> no, I think that you're kind of a little crazy or weird after that. But you got to realize this. You, if you're at that point where you're like, oh, woe is me, oh, poor me, and you're overtly in grief because... God is judging you and punishing you, chastising you for all the sins that you did in your life. Yeah. You got to realize this. That's not a right attitude. You have that self-pity attitude of, woe is me. Oh, I have to suffer this pain. You know what that is? That's a lot of selfishness. Do you not realize that? Because Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 through 9, it's a law. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Yeah. You know, your problem is that, oh, poor me, poor me, when God judges you, when God smacks you. But you got to realize this. No, it's not poor you. It's, oh, stupid me. I deserve this. Yeah. Poor you? You mean to tell me that God has to go light on his judgment over... The sin 
that you committed that you hurt against God and you hurt other people? You mean to tell me that God has to go light on you? No. If God did that, then there is no justice served. And there is no evil do uh, there is no proper judgment against evil doers who've hurt you or other people. There has to be a penalty. Thank God that there is penalty. Because I know that's hard to believe, but thank God there is penalty because I can't stand it that some people have hurt other people, have hurt against God, and they don't pay the price for it. Then we're all going to get away scot-free and that will encourage us, that will motivate us to keep doing sin. We need the judgment. We need the punishment and realize, hey, this is exactly what I deserve. And you know what? I want to thank you, God, that you punish me and judge me for this so that I can tell my wicked, prideful self and my flesh, remember that pain so you don't do that again. Amen. You better remember that pain that you've done, that you've hurt another person, and God's making you reap what you have sown for that. You better remember how much you've hurt God's holiness with your sin, where he suffered the pain on the cross. So this kind of pain that I'm feeling, I better remember that. Amen. That way I don't hurt Jesus again with my sin. Why don't you remember the pain, huh? You know why people keep messing up in sin again? Because they ignore the pain and the judgment they went through. You know why? Because they always get away scot-free with their sin. That's why people still commit sin and hurt themselves and hurt other people. You got to realize, instead of saying, woe is me, you got to say this. This is what I deserve. So I don't need brother and sister so-and-so to say, oh, I'm so sorry and pat you on the head. When you know this is your crime that you committed and the penalty you justly deserved. Wow, that's hard, preacher. No, it's reality and it's truth. That's why some people, they mourn about whatever health problem they're going through when they don't realize it's a constant, maybe it's because of the sin they committed that directly affect their health, like cigarette smoking, for example, like drinking a lot of alcohol, for example. A lot of people go through family and marriage problems and they say, oh, woe is me, poor me. But they don't realize it's directly connected to the sin they committed yeah. because of their their lives as children where they cause family problems or they themselves as a spout that cause marriage problems Amen. themselves with fornication and adultery or etc see that and when you think like that then you would re then this self pity attitude it will definitely diminish more it's going to go man i can't realize that this pain that i'm feeling right now i'm get i'm seeing a flashback a reflection of myself what i did to hurt other people and that will get rid of your self pity attitude do I, do I slap people around when they're going through so much pain, when they reap what they sown? Of course not. I comfort them. I pray for them. I feel sorry for them. But you need to hear this because you never heard something like this for a while, have you? Or probably not at all until now. So you need to hear this now and realize what you've sinned, you've justly deserved, and you should accept it. And that will get rid of your self-pity. But here's another thing. you got to realize this is that instead of wasting time saying, oh, poor me, poor me, of reaping the bad thing you've sown, why don't you start making up time for it by sowing good things so that you can reap a lot of good things to make up for the bad things. Amen. See, a lot of the pain that you're going through right now, that's what you justly deserve, but that doesn't mean you have to stay there. Now, why don't you start sowing good things, huh? Start sowing good things so that it can make up for it. So that you can see joy in the middle of the punishment that you're going through. And eventually full joy at the end of your punishment. See, start sowing good things now. Stop wasting time. Oh, poor me. Poor me. Pat my head on the... Pat my head. Pat my shoulder. Wiggle my toes and tickle my ears and say, Oh, God is good to you. Everything's going to be all right. No, you pay the sin. Yeah. You pay the sin, yeah. now you got to say this, now let me pay some good things so I can get good things in return. Amen. Make up for it. This is your life. Don't waste it. My fourth point is the manure of shortcomings. The manure of shortcomings. You know, people, they love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because they made 
shortcoming mistakes that they really didn't want to make, right? Sometimes you're not that capable. You're not that smart. Sometimes you call yourself stupid. You feel dumb. Because why? You want to help out pastor with something, but then it's always like you made a mistake and you feel like, man, man, why don't I get it? You're applying for a new job and then you want to do this right, but you keep making mistake and mistake and you go, oh man, why did I make that mistake? And you feel stupid. In school, you're like, oh, I'm so eager. I'm going to do this right. But you keep making mistake and mistake and you go, why can't I get it? You take charge of a certain ministry and you're like, Lord, I want to please you and I want to serve you. But when you teach your first message, you preach your first sermon, you help out something in the church the first time when you lead the ministry, you make a shortcoming mistake and you feel bad about it. Hey, instead of wallowing in that manure of self-pity, you got to realize this. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 through 29, And base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What does that mean, preacher? What that means is you got to realize that God's point is, is to use a stupid person like you, a nobody like you, a shortcoming failure loser like you. Those are the people God can only use to glorify his name. Who's the greatest evidence, pastor? Me. I'm the greatest evidence. I'm the most stupid person out of the whole lot. I'm the one who made the mistakes out of the whole lot. And the people who attended my church ever since the beginning know that too. But you've seen how God lifted me up and used me and blessed me with so much fruit. Why? Because I'm show it off. I'm great and I'm talented. No, because I'm the most stupid person out of the bunch. And I accepted that. I embraced my loser status and completely yielded to the power of Jehovah and say, God, can you use it? I can't do anything without you. Can you please help me? And God lifted me up. You got to realize that the only way for God to use such a low flesh for his glory is for you to learn from the low state that you've been in. Then God can lift you up. You know how God makes you powerful? When you see your weakness. When you start to correct your weaknesses. That's how you gain power. Power is not just like zero weakness and God just gives you power like that. That's not how it works. Power comes when you discover your shortcomings first and you correct it all. Do you know why the biggest loser becomes the most powerful person? Because they, they're the ones who correct most of their loser mistakes. Not like the winners who don't see their loser mistakes at all. That's good. Does that make any sense to you? So you got to realize this. If you're talented, you're skilled, and you got all that... And you got to realize this, God can't use you because now you're going by your own might, by your own ability. But when you see your own ability is weak, it's fallacy, it's corrupt, and you start to repent of that, you start to correct it, then what happens is God builds you up even more and powerfully uses you. That's how you become better talented. So stop wallowing in your self-pity of, oh, I made a boo-boo right here. Oh, woe is me. Why do I keep messing up? No, because you keep messing up, that's why your flesh is learning not to make that mistake again and how to make it even better. And not only that, you're going to remember that mistake as years pass by. And because your flesh remembers that feeling of that mistake as years pass by, it will not commit that mistake. And it will know how to improve it. Whereas winners, they don't know what mistakes are like. They don't know what errors are like. So when they are thrust out into a world of doing some task, they have to just do it from thin air. But you, you got the experience. The loser's you. You got the experience because you knew what it was like to make that mistake. What the pain is, what the hurt is. So you know how to do well from there. My fifth point is manure of skill. Manure of skill. People love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because their skills are not good enough to do something for God. I mean, you got to realize this is that there are some people who have poor health issues. And because of that, they feel so down and then they mourn and they whine. Oh, I can't come to church. Oh, I can't help out the pastor. Oh, I can't be there to uh, 
go out soul winning. A lot of people, they're untalented. And because they're untalented, they're like, oh man, I want to preach and teach. I want to witness to this person, lead the person to Christ, but I'm not skilled enough with words. I'm not good like pastor. I don't have the right wording. And oh, I feel down. I see brother and sister so-and-so saying, oh yeah, I led another soul again and I'm still at number zero. Oh, woe is me. And you feel down and you feel sorry for yourself. Some people, they feel down about themselves because they see other people starting some work, starting some ministry, leading souls to salvation with the ministry, whereas they themselves are still just a nobody, just a regular church member coming to church, doing whenever they're asked, and that's it. And they feel down about that. They're like, oh man, I wish I can do something more, but I'm not that... Talented, I'm not that skilled. Hey, get out of that manure of self-pity because the Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 48b, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men shall have committed much, of him they will ask the more. In other words, when God gives you much, he expects much from you in return. Not that when God doesn't give you something that he expects a lot out of you. Do you know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is this. If God did not give you that skill to do something great for God, that shouldn't be something that you mourn and whine about. How can you whine and mourn about, oh, I'm not skilled enough to do that. I'm not skilled enough to do that if God didn't even give it to you. That's good, brother. That's See, good. that's the point. Yeah. So you are not skilled enough because God did not give you that. But he gave you a voice to talk. So if, even if you're bad at soul winning, you can sure make it up with prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even though you're bad at preaching, you can sure make up for it by fellowshipping with other people. Amen. God gave you two eyes to see. So maybe you're not good at observing things in the church where you can help things out, but you can sure use your eyes where you can keep looking at the preacher and pay attention, and that would encourage him when he sees somebody else in the room going like this. Going like, <laughs> like that you know yeah. so you see that you can use your eyes where you can try to use it to glorify God and read your Bible because there are plenty of blind people plenty of people who can't read the Bible Amen. whereas you can Amen. and there are people who do have two eyes to see but they don't have a Bible in their hands in persecuted countries mm -hmm. That's good. so why don't you make up for it by using your two eyes to read the Bible even more so you're not smart to do apologetics you're not smart enough to talk to a Calvinist. It just infuriates you. Hey, man, why don't you use your mind for something else? Use your mind to make your preaching better. Use your mind where you can be able to think things on what can better glorify God, on how to talk to people in better fellowship, in encouraging the pastor. Why don't you use that instead? See, God gave you something. If he gave you two hands, two feet, two eyes, a nose that can smell, a tongue to taste, and a mind to think, why don't you use what God has given to you rather than mourning about the things that God did not give to you? So what? You can't play the piano like Brother Brent can. But you can sure use your hands to pass out tracks. So what? That Brother Brent is not good with using his hands by drawing on a whiteboard and teaching eloquently. And I don't, I'm not an eloquent speaker myself at all. It's a wonder that I can still doodle with my hand while I'm talking something. I just don't even know what I'm saying while I'm drawing at the same time. But you see, Brother Brent can use his hands to play the piano. And sure, the Lord is definitely putting him at work, isn't he, every Sunday? Yeah. See, use what God has given to you and wear yourself out on that and use it as much as you can amen. rather than the things that God did not give to you. Amen, amen, amen. Stop wallowing in self-pity. Woe is me, woe is me. I'm not skilled enough to do that. I'm not skilled enough to do that. I'm not skilled enough to do that. Well, why don't you use your voice for God? Brother Robert is not skilled enough to sing. So he's not going to wallow in his manure of self-pity. Oh, I can't sing. Like, like Sister Danielle or Sister Joyce, I can't sing that loud. But he can use his loud voice to go, Amen. He can use his loud voice for street preaching. See that? So start using it for God. We had to, I had to figure out some way to use his skill when he was singing his song at preach. And I was like, no, we can't do that, brother. We can't do that. So we had to figure out a different way to use his skill. And we found a different way, and it became even better for the glory of God. 
So see, that's the point. The point is find something God has given to you and use that rather than what God has not given to you. All right. My next point is the manure of scoffing. The manure of scoffing. People, they love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because they've been scoffed by their family members, by their friends, by their lover, and especially when the whole world around them seems to scoff them. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pain. And not only that, what's really hurtful the most that I, that I experienced, and I know many Christians have experienced, is being scoffed and misunderstood by fellow Bible-believing Christians. And that pain really hurts. And then you wallow in yourself, pity a manure, and you go, Oh, woe is me. I thought that they were loving brother and loving sister in Christ. And what a loving pastor he was. But no, man, they turned me down. They let me down. And hey, you got to realize this is that you can't wallow in your self-pity like that because there are other things to look at. Because let me ask you this. If um, you are passing by the streets and there's a group of people who are not mentally there but kind of weird and strange mm -hmm. and they were like uh, homeless and they smell bad, and they were out in the corner of a street, and they scoffed at you, they mocked at you, are you going to cry and whine and go, oh, oh, woe is me? No, you know what you're going to do? You're just going to pass by them. Yeah. And it's not going to bother you. You know why? Because you know how crazy they are. Mm. You know oh, that they're yeah. totally different. They're not your world. Yeah. They're yeah. totally different from you. So you can just pass by easily yeah. from them. Yeah. And that's the same thing in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. That's your company. That's your world. Yeah. The book of Hebrews says you're strangers and sojourners in this world. Yeah. So while CNN and the educated scholars mock you, that should not put pressure and fear on you. Amen. Yeah, you know what you should see them as? You should see them as how stupid they are. Exactly. They're crazy. Yeah. And then they're going to say, think that, because hey, don't they think that way of you? Yeah. So shouldn't you think that way of them? Think of them as the poor bums that are not mentally there and going, uh, 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 liberals, uh, equal rights, uh, feminist agenda, uh, 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 Obama, Obama, uh, Trump, uh, Trump, Trump. You should look at them as crazy and just pass by them. Yeah. Why do you get bothered by that? That does not make sense, does it? Yeah. Why does that pressure you? Why does that make you cry and whine and go, oh, woe is me? What? You're just joining the ghetto over there. Yeah. Get out of there, man. Manure of suffering. That's my seventh point. People love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because of what they're suffering in their life. It may be a health problem. It may be a family problem. You're suffering financially. A lot of the busyness is keeping you away from fellowshipping in church or your family. Busyness is really a hassle. Persecution. Genuine persecution in communist or Muslim countries. Or perhaps you lost a loved one. Perhaps a loved one just passed away. Perhaps a loved one just separated from the family. Perhaps a loved one, something bad has happened. But you got to realize this. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. The Apostle Peter, he says, Don't wallow. Don't be sad. In that self-pity of, oh, I'm suffering, oh, I'm suffering. Because why? That's just going to add more to your suffering. Don't you think that you're already crying enough from the pain that you're going through? You don't need to add that pain with woe is me. Woe is me and self-pity. Self-pity. You know what can diminish that feeling of pain? Is to, like Peter said, just accept God working in your life when you suffer for righteousness sake why don't you don't you think that it'll feel better if you accept god working your suffering for good god using the suffering to bless you with more fruit god using your suffering to reward you more at the end 
God using your suffering to bless you even more incredibly? Don't you think that will help diminish your suffering? Think about it. While you're in that state of grief, do you think that your grief is going to get any better when you ponder about it, when you wallow in that self-pity of what you're feeling right now? Or do you think that pain will diminish when you start to think about God's going to use it for good? One day God has to reward me for this at heaven. One day God has to answer my prayer and work it for good. And like he did with Job, double the portion. Like he did with the Apostle Paul in blessing him with incredible riches. Like he even did with Jesus Christ who despised the shame and was exalted above all measure at the end. Don't you think that will help diminish the pain that you're feeling? See, no one likes to feel the pain of suffering. But you got to realize this. You don't have a choice. It's only those two. While you're feeling that pain, there's nothing out of it. It's either feeling the self-pity mode and increasing your pain. Or start thinking about what God's going to use it for good. How God has to pay you back and reward you. You can either go to one option or the other, but only yours is the choice to make. There's nothing else. Oh, what can I do? Oh, why? I just want to escape. And you can't stop getting, get out of the illusion, get out of fantasy, and realize those are the only two options for reality. So you can either accept one or the other. My eighth point is the manure of selectiveness. The manure of selectiveness. In other words, people love and they wallow in their self-pity. A manure because they see how God selected them for small things in life. And the hard things in life. But then God seems to select other people to get away with easier things. To get bigger successes. And you know, that's a major problem among pastors, I noticed. And that really hurts me. You got to realize this. We're all nothing to begin with. That's yeah. one. Okay? I think this, the problem is pride. I think that's the main issue. But aside from that, first, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Now, I'm not going to read you this passage for time's sake, but notice that in verses 3 through 8, as well as verse 18... Notice that the, that the passage shows it's not a matter of who's who. Paul, Apollos, or Barnabas, or Silas, or any of these people. It's not a matter of them. God makes sure to bless each and every one of them with the right amount that they deserved. Notice that in verse 13, see, their work is made manifest. Everyone has a different task that God has put them in. And you got to realize this. It's a lot harder than you think. So you got to realize this. Even though God selected you for this particular task, for this kind of success, which you're not content with, which you feel like it's small, you got to realize this. If God put you at a different task, it would be overwhelming to you and it would probably even kill you and hurt your life. You got to realize that even with the task that you got, God knows that if God gave your task to the other person you're jealous about, who has bigger success than you, that person, it would become overwhelming to him too. Because God knows everybody's different characters and which particular task exactly fits with that character. You got to realize this. You don't know how much pain... The person went through who seems to have bigger success than you. Who seems to have it easier than you. You don't know how much pain and sacrifice they went through. Throughout all the church service, they seem like a very powerful person. Like they're Superman. They smile at you and don't talk about their problems. But you don't know behind the scenes what they're going through. How much immense pain they're going through. You don't want to be jealous of somebody else's life, trust me. Because if God put you in their life, you'd be the first person that says, get me out of here, God. Besides, don't you think that if you truly deserve better than others for the efforts that you did, that you should get the heavenly rewards more than the earthly rewards? Amen. So why do you get jealous of the earthly rewards? Amen. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get out of there. 
The manure of slip-ups. That's my ninth point. People love and wallow in their manure of self-pity because they put forth all their effort to accomplish something for God and they work to, so hard. Lord, I planted a church for four years and we should at least get maybe five more people. But no, I lost ten more people and they slipped up. It's so unfair and it hurts and they wallow in their self-pity. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. I work so hard. I should get at least a little improvement. I'm not asking for a significant blessing or a big improvement, God, but I should at least get a little improvement and then the Lord just puts it even worse. Woe is me, huh? But the Bible says in the book of Joshua, chapter 23, verse 14, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. You got to realize this. All that work, all that effort that you pulled in for the Lord, it's not a slip up. It's not a failure. With God, not one thing will ever fail. Nothing is a failure to God. He promised in that verse, He will accomplish every good thing that He hath promised to you, a child of God. So that failure that you think is a failure, you got to realize this. No, it is an accomplishment. How so, Pastor? Because God sees that failure as building up into something greater. What is that, Pastor? Maybe your character? That's the number one thing I notice most of the time. The reason why the Lord lets slip up happens, no matter how hard you work, is to test your character. Because trust me, what's more gold than more members in the church is your character. Because when your character changes, even more people will be drawn to you and even come to this church. Do you know why people, a lot of people would come to some of these Great Awakening Revival preachers? Because of something in their character that attracted them. See, so you got to realize this is that whether it be job, family, or whatever work that you're doing, and then you seem to fail, no matter how hard you put your effort into it, it's not a failure. The number one reason why is for God to improve your character. That's one thing I realized. But it's not just your character. It's many other things God had in his plan. That's the reason why. So it's not a failure. It was actually a plan to accomplish something better. That's what God was doing. Again, it's not a failure when that bad thing has happened. It's not a failure, but rather a plan to accomplish something better. Why feel sorry over something where God's going to do something great out of it? Oh, woe is me. Failure, failure. No, it's greatness, not failure. You're wasting your time feeling sorry over it. My last point, tenth point, is the manure of self. And that's the ultimate reason why people love and wallow in their manure of self-pity. It's because it's all about me, me, and me. You get upset with how things don't turn out the way you want it to be. That's the reason, ultimate reason why you love that nasty manure. It doesn't go your way. But you got to realize this. At the Romans chapter 9, verse 14 and verse 20. What shall we say then? Is there righteousness with God? Is, uh, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You got to realize this. What gives you the right to feel sorry over God's way of doing things in your life? When you didn't create yourself, you didn't die for your own sins. You couldn't keep your own life together. You don't know every inch of outer space time. And you don't even know your own doings and your own plans. And you're always thinking about yourself and everything you do. Why feel sorry over that self, huh? Whereas God is the one who created you, who died for your sins, who held your life together when you couldn't, who knows every inch of outer space, time, and everything that you do when you don't even know yourself. And he is also completely unselfish. He is completely unselfish in everything he does 
Whereas you, you're completely selfish. So who has the right now, huh, of doing things? Don't you think that his way of doing things is definitely better than your own way of doing things when you couldn't even hold your own life together? You couldn't even breathe unless God gave you that breath? You couldn't, you don't even know every detail of your life when God knows? When you didn't even die for your own sins to save your soul from hell, but God did? Don't you think that this God is far better than to rely on his way of doing things? So why feel sorry over poor me when things don't go my way? Then I dare you for things to go your way and see how it gets better. You never did anything. Things that went your way never made it better, did it? But when things went God way, God's ways, didn't it always go better? Yes, sir. Now, why don't you go by God's ways? Who has the right? You definitely have no right to get on the manure and kiss and love and embrace that nasty manure and say, woe is me, woe is me. Get up out of there. Why not just come down here on the altar and say, have thine own way, Lord. When I'm saying, woe is me, God, and I'm mourning and I'm grieving about my problems, Lord, Sure, I get comforted. I get uplifted by the brethren around me and even by you. Yeah. But God, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been selfish. That's the reason why. It was all about me. That's why I was mourning and groaning and saying, woe is me. Yeah. And I was being depressed and miserable because I was selfish, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Mm -hmm. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Cast off that manure of self-pity. Get rid of the woe is me attitude. Say, Lord, it is you and it is not me. Oh, poor you. I know. I know. And don't, and don't worry. Of course I don't take your sufferings lightly, your grief lightly. But if you were to deep down inside the dark edges of your heart, you know deep down inside it was all about you rather than Jesus Christ. Hasn't God's way of doing things always been better than yours? You have no right to tell him what's better. Because he's the one who kept you up all this time, not you. When you try to keep yourself up, it was always a foil, the plan. It was always messed up. Can't we just go with, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Just say, have thine own way, Lord. At this altar, get off of that manure pile that you've been sitting on. Come down on the altar, get yourself cleaned up by the blood of Jesus. Have that cross wash it all away. Man, you stink. You smell because you've been crying, unwashed, unbathed. You did not shower yet. You didn't take a shower yet because you were wallowing in your grief all this time. Look, you've had enough comfort and uplifting from God and from the brethren. It's now about time that you got to look at your flesh and say, look, you're being selfish. Get up. Get a grip, man. Don't you think that God's way of doing things is better than mine own? So why don't I just get up and start living for God? Why don't I just learn to trust God? I've heard that so many times, just trust God. Why have I always filled my minds with too much complexities? Why did I make it confusing so hard when it was just so simple? It was just simply, have thine own way, Lord. When it was just simply, I am the problem, not others. I am the problem, not this situation. I am the problem, not God. Why do people love the nasty manure? Because of what they sacrifice. They feel like it's too hard. Or because they fell into their frequent sin again. Or because they have reaped what they have sown and it's become overtly grievous. Or it's because of their shortcomings. They always feel bad about the mistake they made, and they don't want to make it again. Maybe because they fell into the manure of self-pity because of 
their lack of skill. They always feel bad that they couldn't do anything more for God when they should realize that they're wasting already the talent God gave to them. They're just not using it. They're only looking at talents that they don't have. Scoffing, that's why they feel self-pity. Suffering, or because God selected someone else to have better success than you, or because of all the hard work you put up, but you just slipped up. But ultimately, as it comes down to the last point, it's about self. That's what self-pity is, it's self. That's why it's called self-pity. God, my Father, I pray that today's preaching have touched and changed people's lives. We get out of the nasty manure, Lord. Thank you so much for washing it away. Heavenly Father, help us to look up at the cross rather than looking down at the, our own dung, at our own nastiness, our own filth. Help us to look up at Jesus Christ hanging on the cross of Calvary and keep pressing onward, upward to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that He died, buried, and resurrected so that His blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through His blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.